We'll flip over to Matthew chapter 21, if you have your Bible. Jesus. Jesus is such a breath of fresh air for us in the days that we are living in. I was thinking about this week that his motives are pure. His vision is crystal clear. His cause is entirely righteous. His methods are wonderfully measured and right. His agenda is pure and selfless. He can be trusted. We so need Jesus Christ in our day. Amen? Amen. Well, by way of review today, Jesus is now in the capital city of Jerusalem, the seat of both political and religious power, and the tension between Jesus and those in power is growing dramatically. First, after the grand parade that took place on Palm Sunday, when Jesus was given a king's entry into the city of Jerusalem by the common people, it said that he then went to the temple and he was not pleased with what he found there. The religious leaders had allowed the outer court of the temple to become a noisy, smelly marketplace, turning what was supposed to be a sacred place for prayer and worship into a den of robbers, to use his words. Jesus cleaned house by tipping over the merchant's table, scattering their stuff, driving out the animals. The next day, as he was on his way back to the city of Jerusalem, he encountered a fig tree that looked beautiful from a distance, but on Close inspection, it was discovered to have no fruit. Jesus used that as a living parable to teach about the people who make a show of their religious devotion, but don't really have any fruit in their lives. Their religious devotion isn't producing any life change in them. The religious leaders of Jerusalem were an example of that kind of person. They had all of the pageantry and the ceremony and the tradition of devotion to God, but they were hypocrites. They were a lot of show and no go. Well, later that day, while Jesus was teaching in the temple court, the religious leaders, they came and they asked him where he got his authority to do the things that he was doing. Well, rather than answering their question, Jesus asked them a question. He asked them if John the Baptist's preaching and baptism were from God or of human origin. They weren't willing to say out loud what they thought about John. First, knowing Jesus would confront them about their failure to respond to John's preaching if they said his authority came from God. And second, they feared the crowds would turn on them if they denied that John was indeed a true prophet. So they said, we don't know. We don't know where John the Baptist's authority came from. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Jesus then tells a parable as an expanded response to this to the religious leaders. And and that parable is what we begin looking at this morning. There there is actually a series of three parables given here, which we'll be looking at, and they all confront and criticize the Jewish leaders in some way. These parables also carry an important message for us in our own day, to not follow their example, either as a church or as individuals. We are vulnerable to the same kind of pride and self-delusion and hypocrisy. Lord, help us to be humble and true followers of Jesus. Well, let's begin in verse 28 of Matthew 21. So right after he tells them that he will not tell them by what authority he has been doing these things, he says this, he says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? 
So still speaking to the religious leaders, Jesus tells this parable about a man with two sons. The man asked both of his sons to work in his vineyard. The first son initially said that he would not do that, but later he went ahead and did as his father asked. The second son, he initially told his father that he would work in the vineyard, but he never really does. Jesus asks, which of the two sons did what the father wanted? And the religious leaders correctly answer, the first son. Even though he was the one who initially refused to work in the vineyard, he later went ahead and did what his father asked him to do. Jesus continues and he says to them, Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So Jesus applies the parable to the religious leaders of his day, contrasting them with tax collectors and prostitutes, people considered to be the most odious and obvious sinners of the day who had believed and repented. Now, to, to help us appreciate the shocking contrast Jesus makes in the application of this parable, we need to remember that tax collectors, remember, were some of the most despised people in Jewish society at that time. They were seen as traitors because they worked for the enemy, the Roman government, and they unjustly profited off their own people getting rich. Prostitutes in those days were some of the vilest and most obvious of sinners in the public's eye. They were a blight on society to be avoided by all who had any concern for their reputation among decent people. Well, similar to the father asking both of his sons to work in the vineyard, so our Heavenly Father wants all people to follow and obey him. The religious leaders, they're like the second son who told his father he would obey him and work in the vineyard, but he didn't do it. The religious leaders, they claim to obey and follow the Lord, but they really don't. They're hypocrites. They use their religion as a tool for gaining and maintaining power and prestige rather than as a means for having a heartfelt relationship with God. They obey the commands of the Lord that are convenient for them and to their advantage, but they don't humbly accept and trust in the Lord's authority over all aspects of their life. Jesus points to the others, including even tax collectors and prostitutes, as being like the first son who initially refused to work in his father's vineyard, but then later went ahead and did it. These people had been living their life, doing what they wanted, rather than obeying and doing the will of the Father, but then they repented of their sin, and they began obeying the Lord. We don't want to be people who give lip service to God, like the second son. We want to be people who really seek to do the will of the Father, like the first son. And if we're not doing the will of the Father right now, then as the first son also did, let's repent and start doing it. It's not too late to start doing what is right and following the Lord. Well, Jesus tells another parable in the hearing of these religious leaders. And if they will listen carefully to this parable, they're going to get the answer to their question about where Jesus' authority comes from. And again, what God thinks about the job that they've been doing as the leaders of his people. So in verse 33, he says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. So after the vineyard had been properly prepared, the owner rented it to some tenant farmers and moved away to another place. This landowner symbolizes God in the parable. 
The vineyard symbolizes Israel, the Jews, God's people. Israel is referred several times figuratively as a vineyard in the Scripture. The tenant farmers, they represent the Jewish religious leaders, the folks he's talking to. God gave them the responsibility to take care of the vineyard, God's people. They were given the job of cultivating the spiritual life of the people. 34. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. A typical arrangement made between a landowner and tenant farmers who rented the land from him was to give the landowner some agreed-upon percentage of the harvest crop as payment for the use of his vineyard. Well, when the harvest time came, the landowner, he sends his servants to collect what was owed him from the tenant farmers, but the tenants, they beat up one servant, they kill a second, and they stone another one. The owner sent many more servants, and the tenants treat them all the same way. These servants represent the prophets of God throughout the history of Israel. The prophets were rejected, they were beaten, they were killed all down through history, usually by those who are supposedly God's own people. Verse 37 says, last of all, he sent his son to them. They'll respect my son, he said. So the owner is desperate to make connection with the tenants and shocked by the shameful treatment they have dished out to his servants, decides to send his son to them, thinking, surely they'll respect my son. Not so, 38. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So the tenants, they saw the coming of the son as a golden opportunity to finally take the vineyard for themselves. So they throw him out of the vineyard and they kill him. Well, we know the son in the parable represents Jesus, right? God the Father sent Jesus, his son, into our world but he's being rejected and will be killed by the tenants, the religious leadership. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He'll bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he'll rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. So Jesus now drives this, the meaning and the implication of the parable home by asking the question, what will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants? And those listening, they answer first, the tenant farmers deserve to be killed for what they've done. And second, they say the vineyard would be given to other tenants. The other tenants in the parable is, is a reference to the new community of God's people that would be formed by Jesus, which we know as the church. 42, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is a quotation from Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. And It's interesting to note that another section of this same psalm, verses 25 and 26, is what the people had been quoting from during Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday two days earlier. It's interesting how one part of this psalm is used to hail Jesus as the coming king, and another part of this same psalm is used to predict the rejection of Jesus as their Messiah. Well, Jesus is the stone the builders rejected. The Jewish leaders are the builders who are rejecting the stone. 
And now this stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone or the capstone, it says. The, the Greek word here can be translated as cornerstone or capstone. You may see both of those translations in your English Bible, depending on the English uh, translation that you are reading from. It, it's the same underlying Greek word. And Jesus is both the cornerstone and the capstone. The cornerstone and capstone were both very important in a stone building. The cornerstone was a special reference stone used to base the entire building on. It was the primary foundation stone that would be laid from which all of the other stones were then oriented. Everything was squared up to the cornerstone. The cornerstone established the position and the soundness of the entire structure. The capstone, sometimes called the keystone, was the final stone put in place to finish and to tie together the entire structure. It was the finishing piece, a common place where you will see a capstone or a keystone in a stone structure is in an arch. The capstone is that special final stone at the top of the arch, which all of the other stones ultimately are resting against. Tying the whole arch together, holding it in place. Well, there are lots of great applications that we could make with uh, this idea of Jesus being our cornerstone and our capstone. Uh, the, the point being made in this particular story is this, that what they considered a cast-off, God made the very centerpiece of all of human history. We might say that this is the ultimate whoops God takes the one who is rejected and he makes him the source of salvation for the entire human race. And that is indeed marvelous in our eyes. 43, therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. These other tenets that were mentioned in verse 41 are again referred to here. The church, which will include people of all tribes and nations, both Jews and Gentiles, is the new community of God's people. And this same stone that is the cornerstone and capstone of salvation will also be the stone of judgment against those who oppose him. 45 says, When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. So the religious leaders listening to the parables, they know that Jesus has leveled a huge criticism and accusation against them, and they are angry, and they become even more obsessed with finding a way to kill him. But they fear the crowd. And that's what prevents them from taking any action against Jesus for the moment. But before the week is out, we know how things will play out. Well, Jesus tells a third parable on this same theme. Jesus spoke to them again in a parable, saying, chapter 22, verse 1, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. So a king, he prepared a wedding banquet for his son. And there's the obvious reference here. God is this father and Jesus is this son in this story. And he instructs his servants to tell those who have been invited to come. It's now time. Surprisingly, the invited guests refuse to come. This would be a tremendous insult to the king and his son, but the king is patient and he's merciful. He, he has his servants make another more enticing and impassioned appeal to the invited guests. In verse 4, 
It says, then he sent some more servants and he said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Still, the invited guests, they refused to come, ignoring the invitation and tending to their own personal business and interests instead. Now, refusing the king's invitation the first time was insulting enough. To refuse the king's repeated invitation is unthinkable, but further, even worse, some go so far as to even mistreat the king's messengers and kill them. Well, not surprisingly, the king is enraged at this point. In verse 7, it says the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. The king, he tells his servants to invite anyone they can find to the wedding banquet. So it says they went out into the streets and, and they brought in everyone, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. It's interesting to consider that the Greek word translated bad, it means evil, wicked, morally corrupt. The bad as well as the good were brought and invited. And I pause at this point and provide some explanation for this first part of the parable, and then we'll take a look at the second part of it. The king obviously represents God in the story. The king's son is Jesus. Now, some will immediately connect this wedding banquet with the marriage supper of the Lamb that takes place at the second coming of Jesus. But this is more than that. This wedding banquet refers to the salvation that God is offering us through Jesus and all that comes with it. These originally invited guests are the unbelieving Jews of the day. In particular, the religious leaders opposing Jesus and those aligned with them. It's, sadly, these people, they have been anticipating the coming of the Messiah for centuries, studying the scriptures, praying and hoping for the amazing day when Messiah would come. But now that Messiah has actually come, they refuse to accept him. And there are many reasons for that, but among them is, one is, as we've talked about before, Jesus, he's not the conquering king Messiah that they wanted that would come and overthrow, overthrow their enemies, the Romans. Further, Jesus is not affirming the religious institution that they have spent so much time and energy creating. In fact, he's critical and condemning of their legalism and their hypocrisy. John's Gospel includes these words as part of its introduction, making reference to how Jesus was being received by the people in his day in John 1.10. John writes, He, Jesus, was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, the Jews, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And now, all people are invited to come to the wedding banquet to receive salvation, the bad as well as the good. No one has been left off the guest list. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you have been or where you are from or what you lack or anything else that you fear might exclude you. All are invited. Everyone. 
Verse 11, the second half of the parable now. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. The king notices that one of the guests is not dressed appropriately. And we're not given details in the story about what this means. Maybe this person has come into this beautiful wedding banquet wearing his dirty street clothes. Maybe he's wearing casual clothes, and this is a formal event which a tuxedo was required to be worn. Some think that the king has given each guest appropriate clothes to wear to the wedding banquet, and this person has failed to wear those clothes, electing instead to wear his own choice of clothing. Well, whatever the particulars might be, the basic idea is that this person has shown up at the banquet unacceptably dressed. And the king confronts him, asking him how he got into the banquet without wearing wedding clothes. And the man is speechless. He can offer no excuse. Based on this man's reaction, he apparently knew what the dress code was, And he chose not to follow it for whatever reason. So the king has this man tied up and thrown outside into the darkness. And then the parable ends with the words, For many are invited, but few are chosen. So I'm going to press this last verse and use it as a proof text for their particular theological system. I don't think this verse was originally intended for that purpose when spoken by Jesus. When it says, many are invited, keeping the rest of the parable in mind, this essentially means that everyone is invited to the wedding banquet. Remember, the king has his servants go out and invite anyone they can find to come. No matter the person's station in life, no matter the person's moral quality, everyone was invited to come. The same can be said of salvation in Jesus Christ. Everyone is invited to come. When it says, but few are chosen, keeping the rest of the parable in mind, this essentially means that all those attending the wedding banquet, are dressed appropriately. First, the guests can't choose to attend the banquet on their own terms, wearing whatever they want. Although everyone is invited, the king determines the qualifications for entry into the banquet. Second, being chosen would usually imply that the king selected each person allowed into the banquet. But but that's not the case in this parable. In this parable, remember, everyone is invited to come. So the chosen refers to those in attendance at the wedding banquet. Are you at the wedding banquet? Then you are among the chosen. It says few are chosen. The invitation is given to many, but not all who are invited respond to the invitation. And even among those who respond to the invitation, some refuse to accept the king's authority over them. They try to enter on their own terms rather than the king's terms. There's an invitation, and there are also terms. For entry. In closing, the Lord is extending his invitation to everyone to come and receive salvation. 
everyone is invited. And I ask you, have you responded to the king's invitation? Or have you been making excuses for why you are not going to come? Why you are not going to receive? Maybe you're a passive excuse maker, like those in the parable who ignored the king's invitation, paid no attention to it, distracted themselves with their own personal business and interests. Maybe you are an active excuse maker, like those in the parable who were hostile toward the king's messengers, actively refusing to come. It doesn't matter which kind you are. The end result is the same. Either you come or you don't. And I want to say come. Come! There is nothing more important in this life than to respond to the king's invitation to receive salvation. Come! There is not another thing going on in your life that's more important. Come. But remember, too, that we don't come to God and receive salvation on our own terms. We come on His terms. Like the person in the parable who couldn't come to the wedding banquet because They weren't wearing the proper clothing. So we can't enter into the presence of the Lord and receive salvation in our own righteousness and our own goodness on our own terms. Why? Because we aren't good enough. We aren't good enough. None of us are. We may have what we think is a very acceptable set of clothes to wear to the wedding banquet. But when we walk through that door into the party, we will immediately realize that the best stuff in our closet looks like dirty rags in comparison to what the king is offering to give us for clothes. Jesus Christ lived the perfect life that you and I could never do. And he took upon himself the punishment We deserve for our sins. He has taken our place so that we can share in his place as children of God. What do we have to do to receive this salvation that God is offering us? First, we need to respond to his invitation to come. Second, we need to put on the wedding clothes that he's provided for us, which means to put on Jesus Christ. Believe in faith that Jesus died for your sins on that cross and he came back to life on the third day to give you eternal life with him in heaven. Trust in his righteousness rather than your own shabby excuse for righteousness. And you will be saved. That's the message. That's the gospel. That's the invitation. That's what Jesus is talking about. And that's what he's done for us. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we we thank you that you, the great king, have provided us wedding clothes. You have provided us your son Jesus in his righteousness to cover us. So we can enter in and sit at your table and be one of your children. And I pray for anyone in this room this morning who has not accepted that invitation and taken on the wedding clothes that you have provided accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that today is the day they would do that, that even in this moment they would say right now, yes, Lord, I want that. I don't want to trust in my own righteousness, which is just ridiculous. I want the perfect life of Jesus to cover me. 
to clothe me. That my entry into your presence and salvation is Jesus. Make that so for every single one of us here today. In his name we ask these things, Lord. Amen.